Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everybody to the CSIS Climate Solutions Series. This is um, session six, the final session of the, of the series brought to you by the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program. This, uh, this session is gonna focus on carbon dioxide removal solutions. I'm John Larson. I direct US energy research at the independent research firm, the Rhodian Group. I'm also a non-resident senior associate in the uh, Energy and uh, Energy Security and Climate Change Program at CSIS, and I'm here today to moderate this panel. Um, before I introduce everybody, uh, I thought I would uh, tee things up by just diving a little bit into what is carbon removal and why is it important? And why are we all uh, dedicating uh, some time today to, to dive into it? Um, and uh, so with, uh, and, and also to put this in context, so the, the previous sessions uh, in this series have explored what it's gonna take to decarbonize the global economy um, with deep dives into four key sectors, electric power, industry, transportation, and buildings. Uh, all previous sessions considered uh, strategies, technologies, and options for uh, reducing emissions through replacing fossil fuels with zero emitting alternatives or avoiding emissions by capturing CO2 from facilities and storing that CO2 safely deep underground. This session is going to be different. We're looking at uh, strategies that actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and keep it out of the atmosphere. Um, so just to, to level set a little bit here, uh, uh, at Rhodium Group, we estimate global net greenhouse gas emissions in 2017, the most recent historical year, were about 52 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, and the IPCC and their 1.5 report found that uh, we need to get that down to net zero uh, as early as 2065 to be on a two degree pathway and as early as 2045 to be on track for one and a half degrees. Um, and uh, the IPCC found that you're going to need all the strategies that this solution series has explored, and then some, as well as carbon dioxide removal. Uh, CO2 removal helps solve climate change, not by preventing emissions from going into the atmosphere, but by, by taking it out, uh, leading to let lower net greenhouse gas emissions in any given year, and uh, also providing an option to help slow and ultimately reverse the rise in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere over time. How much of this carbon removal might we need? Well, uh, the upper bound from the IPCC is something like 20 gigatons, that's 20 billion tons of carbon removal by mid-century every year uh, for every future year after that. Um, and all that depends on how successful all the other emission reduction strategies across countries and the energy system end up being. Uh, 20 billion tons is roughly equal to today's, to today's global emissions from uh, all of industry and all of buildings combined and then put in reverse. Uh, and so it's no small undertaking. Uh, just focusing on the US for a second, work that uh, my team at the Rhodium Group has done previously, uh, looked at strategies for the US to get to net zero by mid 2050, by mid century. and um, we found that uh, even if you did everything you're supposed to do, full electrification, uh, full efficiency, decarbonizing electric power, everything that everybody says you got to do, you're still going to need somewhere between 1.8 and 2.3 billion tons of carbon removal in the United States uh, uh, as part of a U.S. strategy by mid-century to get to net zero. That's more than the entire electric power sector's emissions in the U.S. today, again, in reverse. Uh, that's also more than two and a half times the current amount of annual carbon removal in the U.S. from forests and soils. So one thing's clear, we're going we're gonna to need a lot of this. Uh, uh, and more importantly, carbon removal doesn't provide a free pass for decarbonization. Uh, you still have to do all the other things we have to do, and we need carbon removal. Uh, 
it's going to be uh, uh, possibly the only way to counteract emissions from key sectors like shipping and aviation and, and agriculture. Uh, so carbon removal lately has been getting a lot of attention. Uh, major corporations like Microsoft and just, just recently Occidental Petroleum have made carbon removal a key component of their long-term uh, corporate greenhouse gas reduction targets. Meanwhile, in the US, there's federal tax credits and state policies that are now in place to pay companies to actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere using specific strategies. And uh, the really interesting thing about carbon removal, unlike say, say renewables or something like that, it, it's a lot of different options um, come in different shapes and sizes and strategies uh, across the sector and um, everything from enhancing natural systems on earth uh, in soils and forests to new technologies that pull CO2 out of the air uh, directly and store it underground. Um, and so just how important carbon removal is to solving climate change, uh, we're gonna find out in this, this session. Uh, and we're gonna uh, make sense of what all the key options are and what it's gonna take to scale them up. So with that, we have to do all that, we have the stellar panel with us today to help us make sense of this all, sense of it all. I've got uh, Roger Ains, who's the uh, Energy Program Chief Scientist at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. We've got Aaron Burns, Policy Director at uh, the Think Tank Carbon 180, and Kathy McDonald, the North American Natural Climate Solutions Director at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so as far as this format's gonna go, I'm gonna ask uh, each panelist a few questions and provide some remarks on uh, key topics. Then we'll have a broader set of questions for the panel, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Uh, so audience, uh, there should be a Q&A tab on your Zoom window. Uh, anybody who has questions, please submit them through that Q&A tab, uh, and we will uh, do our best to get to as many as we can at the, uh, the back end of the panel. Uh, so with that, uh, Roger, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you know, you, you have at your energy um, at your lab at Livermore have looked at a variety of different um, carbon removal strategies across, across, the, uh, across the spectrum. Could you give us an overview of the different methods of uh, CO2 removal? Certainly. So the first thing that we should think about when we think about carbon removal is, is nature. You know, nature is, is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere all the time. And so the question is, can we help it along? Can we speed those processes up? And Kathy's gonna talk about that, but some of the important ones you'd think about are reforesting land that has been previously cleared. That's a big deal in the United States where much of the Eastern United States is reforesting actively today. Um, you think about increasing soil carbon. We've lost an enormous amount of carbon from bad farming practices, can we just return that? So those kind of natural solutions are things which have a lot of benefits and they, they tend to be relatively inexpensive. They also tend to need maintenance. So that's a thing that we have to think about, but, but those are always the, the first thing that you should think about when you think about removing uh, carbon dioxide from the atmospheres, letting, helping na mother nature along. Now, on the far other end of the scale, we think about using machines to do this. And this is a particularly attractive concept because it's simple to think about. If we have a giant machine that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, then we don't have to have a bunch of other intermediary processes. We can just understand that that's gonna do the job. And if we use it to store it underground, if we inject it in deep underground in the same kind of rocks that hold oil today, the CO2 behaves much like oil at those depths and the rocks will hold the CO2 just like they held oil. If we inject that CO2 from machines deep underground, then it's a pretty simple accounting. We just put a meter on the pipe and we say how much CO2 went underground and it stays there permanently. Um, but unfortunately, unlike the natural solutions, that's very expensive today. And we have great hopes of driving the cost down and governments are investing money to do that and a lot of private parties are, but today, it's a lot of money. In between though, there's what I call the hybrid solutions. And those are things that combine the two where you use some uh, activity of nature and then you combine it with some engineered activity of man. So you can use our engineering expertise to speed things up. And when uh, the models that John mentioned, the one and a half degree C report came out, there was a, a concept in there called BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And I have to say that's the first energy technology ever invented by a computer model. 
um, it doesn't really exist. It's something that the models tell us we should have. And basically the idea is that all the biomass that we use for energy, burning wood, burning things like that, uh, waste around the world, we should capture that CO2 and put it underground. And that would be a, a fairly immediate transfer of CO2 from the atmosphere to the subsurface. And that's a great idea. Um, the problem is that it, it doesn't actually exist today and that burning biomass to make energy is, is a less and less attractive option for a lot of reasons. But they, the advantage of it is that if you have this material available, you can do it readily today. And one of the cautions that I would make there is that you people talk about growing new crops for this purpose. I, I'm very cautious of that when especially when we have enormous amounts of waste biomass available in the world today that we could start with so that's i think a, an important hybrid solution is to take our waste our trash our forest waste here in california we're going to be clearing forests to reduce fire hazard what are we going to do with that wood um, and agricultural waste around the world so those are all important things that are going to be part of it but in the end you have to also think what are we going to do with that CO2 once we take it out of the atmosphere and, and that's where the geologic storage is important. Um, in, in natural storage, in na the nature systems, you basically maintain those systems and they keep the carbon in the natural system. But in any of the engineered or hybrid approaches, you have to uh, look to geologic storage that's gonna keep it permanently underground. So those are the, the, the big three, as I call them today. And I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Roger. That's, that's a really great overview of, of kind of the, the landscape we're going to be exploring today. Um, I'm wondering if you could, uh, now, now that you've covered kind of the high level, there any curveballs, any uh, wildcard technologies that uh, perhaps if folks have heard of carbon removal in the past, they haven't heard of, of um, some of the kind of frontier technologies that while maybe our early stage today uh, could have a huge potential to make a big difference in removing CO2 in the atmosphere down the road? Yeah, there are. And this it becomes a matter of timing. You know, the things that I talked about are available at some scale today, and we can scale them up rapidly. And the things I'll talk about now are, are um, a little further down the road, but that's good. We, we, we need to develop them. Um, the first is to engage the oceans. For a long time, we've avoided the oceans in this problem because it's, there's so many problems in, you know, basically the problem is trash in the ocean. You don't want to do something that hurts the ocean. But today, most of the carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere ends up in the ocean anyway. And so thinking about engaging those, removing CO2 from the ocean directly, which would reduce acidification, or using things like algae grown in ocean to uh, remove CO2 indirectly are things that people are starting to think about today. And, and considering that the ocean is taking the brunt of the damage that we uh, are doing with climate change today, it, it's, it's appropriate to think about what role can it play in, in helping solve the problem. A second one is another natural process that I'm, as a geologist, I'm very fond of, and that's carbon mineralization. The, the natural cycle in the planet that controls carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is one in which rocks that come up deep from the, the planet's interior are highly reactive with CO2. They react with CO2, they form calcium bicarbonate that flows down the oceans and, and go, ends up in the ocean where it buffers the pH of the ocean and eventually turns into limestone. And that's how the atmosphere of the planet is maintained at hopefully about 280 or 300 parts per million, not the 400 we're at now. So, can we speed that up? Can we encourage the breakdown of rocks? Can we encourage the exchange of alkalinity with the ocean? Those are things that I think are, are, could be very important because, because they use these natural processes, we don't have to add energy to them. That's one of the things I really like about the mineralization aspect is that sure you have to grind the rocks up or do some processing or handling of them, but that's really trivial compared to the amount of energy that it's used. Um, for instance, the, the limiting factor on direct air capture today is energy. It's not for mineralization. So that's one that I think down the road is going to be very important. And I love the combination of the alkalinity of the ocean and, and buffering the acidification of the ocean by helping with mineralization. Great, that, so those are, uh, those are some things to keep an eye on over time here. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, Aaron, Roger mentioned direct air capture. Uh, you know, we, we have rhodium done um, to work on it in the past. Uh, and I wanted to ask you kind of what are the most promising signs for that technology uh, now and looking forward? 
you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Roger talked about the technology. I just want to start off by saying this is a technology that already exists today. I think um, sometimes folks think that this is something that's in the future. We do hope to see it scale up a lot, but we have projects happening today. Um, we've got Climeworks, I think, has 15 projects globally. You have Carbon Engineering announcing uh, a plant that they're, I think, in the engineering phases for in the U.S. and Texas that's going to uh, pull a million tons per year from the atmosphere. We're going to need, John, talked, you talked a lot about the kind of scale of the need for things like direct air capture. We need a lot more of that, but that's really, really promising, especially when we look back a few years ago, um, when we, um, you know, to see the, the increase in these plants and the increase in activity in the private sector. You mentioned that this is an expensive technology, and right now it is expensive. And for that reason, we're going to need policy support to drive down those costs and to get some of that deployment scaling up early. Luckily, there's been an enormous amount of momentum on direct air capture policy um, at the federal level in the U.S. over the past couple of years. The first place that we really paid attention or, or kind of our big push was around research and development support. At the end of 2018, uh, the National Academies came out with a report had a lot of specific recommendations on, on R&D needs for direct air capture. And to, uh, up to that point, the Department of Energy had spent, I think, about $11 million total, not per year, but total on direct air capture. And some of that, I believe, included funding for the NAS study, so very minimal amounts of funding. And then we saw the NAS report come out. We saw the 1.5 degree report come out around the same time, which emphasized that you're going to need direct air capture, you're going to need carbon removal if you're going to meet those climate goals. And what we saw in the next appropriation cycle, and there was a lot of advocacy and work behind the scenes, of course, but what we saw was Congress funding um, direct air capture and negative emissions technologies, carbon removal more broadly at much higher levels. So um, we saw uh, $60 million at the Department of Energy for negative emissions technologies just in that year. Um, and then another $8 million at the Department of Defense. Coupled with that, we're right now, you know, I mentioned only $11 million that have ever been spent on negative emissions technologies on direct air capture DOE. There's not a program at DOE dedicated to carbon removal right now. Um, and so there are bills to authorize and establish those programs to update the Office of Fossil Energy where carbon capture research happens to include a carbon removal program in collaboration with the ERE. And those are bills that have moved forward that have passed um, the House that are part of Senate Energy and House Energy Innovation Packages. Um, that are pretty deeply bipartisan um, and not something that we're seeing a lot of controversy around and, and, and we're seeing a lot of support for those. Um, the House, uh, this, this year's House Appropriations Bill not only included more annual funding for direct air capture, but included another 200 plus uh, million in funding um, off budget. So we're also seeing um, interest in and in thinking about how from policymakers and how to spend more money on direct air capture through things like stimulus recommendations or stimulus packages. Um, in addition to those R&D provisions, which we think are really important, policymakers are also looking at kind of next steps. So there's a bill called the CREATE Act. It's in the House and the Senate. Again, totally bipartisan. That's looking at not only do you have, how do you scale up direct air capture, but how do you think about cross-agency? You know, Roger talked about all of those, the natural, the tech, the hybrid solutions. How can all of those work together? And how do you make sure that the federal government, when we're seeing scaling up of this, where, you know, policymakers are expecting this is something that, that they're going to continue to work on, how do you make sure there's coordination across all of those agencies? Um, I mentioned that uh, in the previous appropriations bills that passed, there was $8 million for the Department of Defense. I think that's a really interesting and very potentially, a potentially very promising uh, avenue for direct air capture scale up. Um, Roger also mentioned ocean capture. So I'm gonna lump in direct air capture and direct ocean capture a little bit here, um, just for the, the uh, sake of uh, not getting too complicated. But the Department of Defense is looking at things like readiness applications of direct air capture, where you're looking at things like direct air capture to fuels on aircraft carriers. And there has been um, a company called Opus 12 that has a contract to work on this from the Air Force. And so, you know, when we're thinking about how to spend money to, at the federal level, to bring down the cost of, of direct air capture technology, the DOD coming in, that can be, a, I think, a huge advantage to thinking about those early, you know, they're not going to be as worried about if they're paying 200 300, 400, 500, 600 dollars per ton for direct air capture if readiness is their main concern. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention on the policy that's happening now, um, that appropriations funding, DOE is already, the Department of Energy has already started to put that out. 
Um, they announced, I think, like $21 million in funding going out to direct air capture. And one of the things that we are most excited about, so a little history on Carbon 180, um, we used to be called the Center for Carbon Removal. We've been around for about five years. Um, we've been, which is a pretty long time to have worked on carbon removal. And uh, when we first started working on this, this was something that um, we had to really start with, this is what carbon removal is a lot of times. And this is what direct air capture is. And um, I will say I met our one of our co-founders in 2015, shortly after uh, he started the organization. And I worked in the Senate on carbon capture. Um, I actually sent him off to talk to somebody else after he told me about direct air capture to make sure that he, what he was talking about was legitimate and that he wasn't just sort of like wasting all of our time. Uh, they obviously came back and said, oh, yeah, he's totally legitimate. Um, but I mentioned that because when we saw all of the projects that were funded through DOE, we didn't know all of them. I think that is like the first time that we've been kind of surprised to see a bunch of new entrants into this space where we weren't like, oh yeah, we knew this was coming for, you know, the past six months. Um, and so I think that's really promising um, when we're talking about the, the scale up of director capture, because, you know, there are a couple of companies that we think of um, carbon engineering, climate et cetera, but there aren't a ton of companies right now um, uh, that are kind of major players in this space. And if we're going to be successful, we're going to need to see a lot more players. The last thing I want to mention that I think makes us really excited about the potential for director capture deployment is that we're seeing more momentum on climate policy overall and on major climate policy and momentum for climate policy is really good for direct air capture. Um, this is something we see direct air capture reflected in, in, in basically all major climate policies. I mentioned the innovation packages, some of the bills coming out of places like the House Energy and Commerce Committee, but also the Green New Deal talks about carbon removal. The, uh, Sanders, uh, the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force talks about carbon removal. The Biden campaign has talked about carbon removal. Um, you know, the you look at the transition page, negative emissions technologies uh, is listed under their climate work, I think, before some other pretty major uh, solutions. So, um, which this is all in addition to, to mitigation. And that's super important, as John mentioned. But all of that, that sort of momentum that we're seeing for major climate action is not only just generally great for direct air capture, but it's something where we're seeing direct air capture be specifically called out on it. And, and so we're really excited to see what's going to happen over the next year and four years. That's great. So a lot of activity in the last, you know, in a very short amount of time on this technology. Um, maybe maybe you, you, you ended by talking about, you know, things are exciting for the next few years. What, what is the next step? Like, what is the next policy or policies that you uh, at Carbon 180 see are kind of essential to really getting direct air capture to scale up and get, you know, take off? Yeah, I, this isn't uh, an exhaustive list, but I think it's helpful to think about in kind of three categories. The first is that research development uh, demonstration deployment funding. I mentioned that we're seeing kind of historic levels. We aren't at, you know, we need to continue ramping that up if we're going to stay on that trajectory laid out in the National Academy's report. Um, and I think that even some of the folks there would say that's a that's a kind of minimum amount. You know, we could see and use, and I think it would be really helpful for director capture to have more than what's laid out in the National Academy study. Um, so continuing to work on those new authorizations to establish programs at the, at the Department of Energy on RD&D &D, um, and to make sure that those are really well funded. I think that's one really, really important piece. Um, and, and I'm actually gonna throw in, I think director capture is only successful if you also think about making sure that things like carbon utilization, carbon storage are really, really successful. And that's something that the Department of Energy has a big role to play in as well. The second category I think is deployment support. We've seen a little bit of this for direct air capture. So the 45Q tax credits were historically focused on carbon capture. There was an update in 2018, um, made a lot of changes, but one of those was to include direct air capture for the first time ever. Um, that's really great. Um, the funding levels through that may not be totally sufficient to see. I don't, I don't think we expect to see a ton of scale up at something like $50 per ton. Um, so we're going to need to think about additional deployment support. Um, so that could be, you know, more tax incentives. That could be um, carbon use procurement, you know, thinking about if you have direct air capture, you're taking that carbon dioxide, you're turning into products, then you have the federal government purchasing those products, or you have state government purchasing those products, you're starting, you're starting to see state policies pop up here. Um, there's also a lot of thought going into how would that fit into a federal buy clean policy. We're going to have a white paper out about, um, about this specific issue coming soon. Um, 
And, um, in, and I want to plug, uh, John talked about Rhodium's work on here. I think Rhodium has a lot of really cool ideas um, in, uh, in their report. Um, and uh, something we were actually talking about, the, uh, the panelists were talking about beforehand, I think one thing that's really important here is you're not going to get a single policy that scales up director capture. You're not going to get one tax incentive that's just big enough. And I don't think that's um, the most effective or durable kind of policy. And what you're going to need is lots of those overlapping policies. Um, to really see director capture scaled up. This third bucket that I actually think um, is one of the most interesting and sometimes gets ignored is the kind of infrastructure and regulatory bucket. The way that we permit geologic, Roger talked a lot about like geologic saline storage. We don't have a particularly functional way to regulate geologic saline storage right now. We have an underfunded program at the EPA. Only two permits have gone out ever um, under this program. They took about six years. This was, and it was six years for a project that DOE was support, like was supporting. So this is, it's, it's really hard to get a class six permit, which is what you need for geologic saline storage. You need to fix that if you're going to have director capture scaled up. If you're thinking about developing these projects, you're gonna care about that regulatory certainty. Um, you also have to think, sorry y'all, I have a pulled together text set up here. Um, you're also gonna need to think about the infrastructure. You're going to need to think about CO2 store, CO2 um, transport, CO2 pipelines, and I also think this is um, going to be a challenge in the U.S. for a number of reasons. And one of them is that I think we have had a model of scaling up carbon management technologies and carbon capture, specifically of let's build a, a few really big projects, let's dump a bunch of money into them. And we're going to bring down the cost of those projects, and that's going to make it a lot easier to build them. And I think that has ignored cost six. I think that's also ignored those kind of larger infrastructure um, challenges. And I think one thing that we can learn from is looking at some of the work that Northern Europe is doing, that Norway is doing, thinking about, you know, can we pre-permit some of this work? Can we think about the role of government as not just bringing, not just spending a billion dollars on a big project, which I'm frankly, totally fine with. Um, that's not a C-180 position, maybe, but an Aaron Burns position. But I think what can be more effective is to think about the role of government and saying, how do we build out those, the, the, the kind of underlying infrastructure so that project developers can come in and build those projects that they have that clarity on, you know, how are you going to move this um, CO2? How are you going to store this CO2? And then you have policies like um, the, the deployment ones we talked about, tax incentives to help finance those. Um, you know, you have the government as a consumer for your, uh, you know, low embodied, uh, low carbon embodied uh, concrete. Um, and so I think that, that that final piece is one that I think is much much more difficult politically, um, but I think is just absolutely necessary if we're going to see DAC succeed at scale. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Erin. That's a lot, a lot to cover. And uh, I think it's kind of exciting to think about uh, all the all the different things we could could get pursued in the in the next Congress. Um, moving over to you, Kathy. Uh, you know the Nature Conservancy literally has nature in its name. Um, so when you know thinking about natural climate solutions, uh, you know how how does uh, the Nature Conservancy ca categorize and what's the framework you use for thinking about the different opportunities here, and how big is their potential to uh, remove CO two from the atmosphere? Absolutely, thank you. And just um, uh, to start, uh, the Nature Conservancy supports both natural and technological uh, carbon capture as a really critical part of uh, an overall comprehensive uh, climate action plan. So uh, we agree that both are very important. Um, I appreciated Rogers uh, saying, turn to nature first. Uh, and um, we have uh, done put a lot of time and effort into researching the potential role of the land sector in uh, uh, mitigating climate impacts, uh, both kind of the adaptation side and the mitigation side. Uh, a global study that um, my colleagues did uh, with many others uh, looked at estimates that we could globally get about 11 gigatons of um, of uh, emissions benefits uh, from the land sector uh, through the application of, uh, a, of a, about 20 different uh, land use and land management practices. Some of those are uh, focused on removals and some of those are focused on avoiding um, emissions. Uh, so the broad categories that we talk about are protecting carbon in existing natural ecosystems, 
restoring carbon to uh, uh, to uh, in natural ecosystems, uh, and then improving land management, uh, especially lands that are producing our food and fiber, so that they can store more more carbon. So those are the broad um, pathways that we look look at. Uh, and then more specifically, um, we've identified, uh, as I mentioned, about 20 um, individual uh, actions that can be taken uh, and have quantified the benefits of each of those actions. And um, in, here in the US, one of the biggest ones is reforestation. Uh, that's the biggest pathway. Uh, but currently, the land sector in the US um, offset, or reduces our total emissions by about 12%. And in the study that we did here in the US, uh, it, it looked that we could nearly triple that for the performance of the land sector. And uh, there's significant uh, opportunity at um, a pretty low cost, as uh, Roger mentioned. Um, uh, natural climate solutions are uh, fairly low cost uh, options. The other uh, benefit to natural climate solutions is there are a lot of co-benefits that come with uh, those uh, the climate mitigation benefits, including uh, cleaner air and water, uh, improved fish and wildlife habitat, uh, healthier communities. Uh, so there are just a lot of reasons to think about the natural climate solutions uh, as an important part. And because it's our um, only real um, ready uh, technology uh, and our oldest technology, it's certainly an important thing to be thinking about in the near term as a critical part of, uh, of how we address climate. Got it, and um, that's really great. So, so you set up to 11 gigatons. Um, okay. So a lot, a lot of potential here, uh, which, is, which is important um, and a lot of co-benefits. So then thinking about how you actually uh, get those tons, um, what, are, what are the kind of key policy levers that uh, you know, decision makers, policy makers could be considering that could really uh, uh, get these tons on the board and help to, to solve kind of climate change. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the uh, ca general categories of policies that Aaron mentioned um, are also really important for uh, natural climate solutions, financial support, additional research and development, um, uh, streamlining so that we can get projects done faster. So there, there's a lot of consistency across those areas. Um, when we think about the big opportunities to deploy uh, natural climate solutions at scale, um, you know, we think about uh, opportunities uh, we can advance through improved policies, uh, through improved uh, financial investment opportunities, and improve corporate practices. So those are the kind of the big opportunities that we see. Um, this past year, a number of uh, bills have been introduced to help advance natural climate solutions. Um, two of those uh, were focused on uh, addressing some barriers uh, to uh, engagement in voluntary markets. Um, one being the Growing Climate Solutions Act uh, and another one being the um, uh, the uh, Rural Forest Market Act, um, both of those are designed, uh, one is the, the latter is designed to uh, use federal uh, resources to help de-risk private investment in, um, in improved forest management. And uh, the former is really helping uh, provide some techn technical assistance to landowners so that uh, they can uh, enter into the into carbon markets uh, more confidently um, and, and uh, easily. In addition, there are some uh, existing authorities that the agencies have that we can um, deploy at a higher level. Um, a good example of a bill that was introduced this year is the Replant Act. Uh, Replant Act uh, would increase the cap on the uh, reforestation trust fund. That fund is currently um, receives revenue from tariffs on wood products. Uh, it's the current cap is at $30 million. And uh, as we, um, the, the revenue uh, from those tariffs uh, is over 100 million annually. So there's a lot of opportunity to increase reforestation um, that's really needed given uh, increased wildfires and uh, hurricane impacts to forests in the South. 
Um, so there's a, a lot of need to increase that cap to uh, help with uh, greater reforestation on public land. So in addition to those concepts, um, you know, smart land use decisions that not only um, reduce emissions from transportation, but also uh, keep our communities more compact and uh, reduce conversion of native habitats is really important to think about, as well as the management policies that we advance on federal and state lands uh, and incentive programs like, like many of the programs in the Farm Bill. Those are all important ways that we can help accelerate the deploy deployment of natural climate solutions. Great, that's that's really helpful. Thanks, Kathy. So, um, so now we've heard kind of the, the 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 broad portfolio of options. We've gone deep on technology. We've gone deep on natural. So, uh, and we've got a lot of questions from the audience. So, I think what I'm going to do is pose a couple of questions myself, and then we'll we'll expand from there. But uh, the first one is, you know, just hearing both uh, Kathy and Aaron, both of you talk, uh, as you said, Kathy, there's a lot of similarities in the at least the types of levers for pursuing these things. And, and I actually, I mean, it, it brings up one question, which is, um, that I'll pose to all three of you, which is, um, are, there, are there one size fits all policy, policies for carbon removal that can get at all of this at once? Or do we need to be thinking about more um, uh, uh, specially designed targeted policies that get at different types of carbon removal options. You see, I actually got this question from a Hill staffer today. So, so it's one reason why it's on my mind, but like, you know, is there, is there one or maybe a, a handful of like broad brush tactics that can get at uh, all of the natural and, you know, help incentivize all of the natural and technological, or do we need to be thinking about the unique attributes of natural and technological in ways that, that might inform different policy strategies? Um, who's, who's game first? I could imagine um, the pro probably the one that would be easiest, more easily applicable across the board would be um, tax incentives uh, and designing tax incentives for both both types of activities. Um, at least for natural climate solutions, I think we need targeted uh, policies as well uh, because the opportunities are pretty different. Um, but uh, I think in the uh, tax incentive. Uh, or broader deployment is probably one of those places of common ground. I agree. I think I think we do need targeted policies. Um, I think we need policies that are there are going to be some policies that can help multiple pathways. Um, you know, we mentioned 45Q already. Um, that's going to help direct air capture. That's also going to help carbon utilization. Um, but I do think there are a couple of things that one, I think we can think about coordination across these and thinking about deploying these things together. So I mentioned there's a bill called the CREATE Act that looks at coordination across agencies. That's across all solutions. So that's including the Department of Interior, that's including USDA, that's including DOE. This is a much broader, you know, I do think that coordination um, and that kind of co-deployment can be really um, important. And so I do think that there can be like that sort of, those sorts of overarching policies. Um, I, I do also think though, to be clear, when I think about targeted, I, I do think we need targeted policies for, you know, different director policies for director capture than we need for soil carbon. Um, and we're going to need like multiple policies for each of those. I do think it's important when we're designing those though, and I think of this especially, we, we do work on um, land-based carbon removal, by the way, at Carbon 180. I'm not that expert. There are other folks on our team um, who, who know a lot about that. Um, but I do think it's important that say for direct air capture that we do have targeted direct air capture policies, but they're policies that grow a lot of direct air capture technologies and, um, and companies. And I think that's something that's really important and that we're, we try to be really thoughtful about because right now we are at a stage where we only have a handful of companies. They do have different technologies, but you know, hopefully 10 years from now we have direct air capture technologies that we don't know about right now. Um, and that we have new companies that we've not heard about that are going to be started in a few years because of these programs. So I do think it's important to target them, but I also think it's important to make it broad enough that you aren't just saying, this is how you scale up these two technologies and this is what we're placing our bets on. Yeah, I think that's an experience that we've had in California as well. Of, um, you don't want to lock in your choices too early in that I see the kinds of, of monetary support that's needed here is falling into two areas. Of course, there's the research and development 
support. That's very important. But the actual payment for carbon removed from the atmosphere should not be too focused on exactly what technology is it was done to accomplish that. If, if you have a certified analysis that says we removed a ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, that should get a, a payment across any range of technologies or natural options or however you do it. And that will encourage more thought, more breadth, and we just need a lot of different ideas. Um, the, the scale that John mentioned at the beginning is almost unimaginable. 20 billion tons a year is uh, four times the size of today's oil industry by weight of material. Imagine that. In 30 years, we're going to create something that's four times the size of today's oil industry. That takes a lot of ideas. A lot of people have to engage. You've got to get, you know, people in Indonesia and people in, in the United States and, and, you know, everywhere around the world engaging. And, and you don't want to constrain these things. You, you need to help, help them. You know, thousand flowers bloom. Maybe we need more than that. It's a great segue, Roger, to, to my next question for all three of you, which is, uh, are certain types of carbon removal solutions, whether natural or technological, better suited to certain ge geographies? So are there certain parts of the world where, you know, either a, you know, your afforestation is just the way to go, that's the thing to do, uh, or, or conversely, there's certain parts of the world where direct air capture is just not, not a good plan. Right, like just not going to work very well, and I'm wondering if folks could um, have thoughts on kind of where where certain solutions are better suited to certain places. You know, the way you phrase that, I would I would turn it around. Instead of in the negative, I would say where are the places that are particularly good <laughs> for doing this, so that we can we can start there. And it's it's absolutely true that there are going to be some uniquely beneficial places. Um, obviously, there are places that grow forests much better than other places. Um, uh, but, you know, with the uh, massive amount of CO2 we have to remove, one of the things we have to think about is what are you going to do with that CO2? And so geologic storage is important and places where it's both easy and politically acceptable are going to be um, important places for doing um, uh, carbon removal. Erin or Kathy? Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, one of the things that we're very focused on is trying to make sure that all the new technologies we need to decarbonize are um, placed in places that uh, have the least impact on the existing carbon stocks that we have in natural and working lands. And so being thoughtful about um, where we put those, um, to Roger's point, uh, certainly there are places where uh, reforce or reforestation is going to work a lot better than in other places and so we need to be thoughtful about that as well. Um, there are places that that you know forests can come back on our on their own. Uh, one of my colleagues just published a paper in Nature that looked at globally at the opportunity for um, passive reforestation in different parts of the world. So we have to I think be very mindful of, um, of where we do what take what actions to be most efficient and effective in this in this space. One of the things is that one is oh. go ahead, Erin. Uh, these are a little broader, but uh, one is there's been a lot of focus on uh, the US reentering the Paris climate agreement. Um, and uh, one thing I think is important for the US to do is to think about there are going, like Roger said, there are places where this is, these things are particularly helpful or particularly well suited for the geography. And so thinking about using things like uh, UN funding mechanisms to provide support for places that do want to deploy this. Um, the other thing that I think, and we think a lot about this in the US and, um, and have been doing more work on this, is we're talking about this uh, as a CO2 problem. And we're talking about this just in terms of we're gonna kind of look at a map and use our models and, and place these things in the place where there's great like geology. That's an important part to think about. It's also important to think about where are these, like do communities want these, you know? Where are these, these interact with people and with existing policies. And there are, you know, we've seen, you know, energy infrastructure in US scale up in a way that is like deeply harmful to, to, to lots of different communities. Um, and so I think it's also really important to think about which communities want this. How do we scale this up in conjunction with those communities? How do we think about not only using this, not only using these technologies to remove 
carbon dioxide to help with, you know, to, to address climate change, but to also think about not just minimizing harm, but how do you maximize benefits for these communities? You know, who has access to um, the jobs that come from, you know, uh, CO2, direct air capture to carbon utilization production? How do you think about, you know, who has access to the sorts of incentives we're going to talk about for soil carbon that are not just going to help the climate, but are going to also help the farmers and ranchers um, and their output. So I, I think that that's something else when we're thinking about where geographically these are going to be, um, you know, where they're going to be deployed in the U.S. and globally, that we have to think about those human pieces and using this as a way to, using carbon removal as a way to um, repair those harms uh, that, are, that are very human and not just about CO2. Um, that's great. Uh, so, so I want to make sure we get, we, we now have several dozen uh, questions from the audience. So I'm going to try and uh, curate and uh, put things together to cover a, a lot of ground at once here. But one, one theme that comes through in the questions from the audience is, um, and I'm going to paraphrase a bunch of this, but where does the money ultimately come from, right? Like, so if we're talking about 20 gigatons uh, or someone's, even just that magnitude, like just that order of magnitude, forget about it getting to that goal, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're several decades into this, we're at scale. Is the, you know, is this, is this all government driven? Is it private sector? What, what does that world look like? And what does the financial flows look like? Where is the money coming from? And how, how what are the business models around it? Like, um, does anybody want to take a stab at kind of painting that picture or, or have some thoughts on that? Roger, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I want to start with the issue of how much money are we talking about yeah. first? And, you know, you, you mentioned that this is the tail end of a lot of seminars that are about getting down to the minimum, you know, getting down to the minimum emissions that we can get, which I think of as about 20% of what we have today. So put putting the cost of getting there aside, which might actually be a benefit, we might be saving money by getting there. But um, we recently did a study for California in which we called Getting to Neutral that looked at what would the costs of applying all these things in California be to get that roughly 20% of California's emissions that will take. And it's a lot less than you might think. It's um, a, on average a cost of less than $100 a ton of CO2. For California, that's 125 million tons of CO2. So um, for California, it's about $8 billion a year. Okay, that's a lot of money. But in California, we spend three times that much taking out the trash we have today. Um, it's about three tenths of a percent of today's economy in 2045, in which our economy will grow dramatically by then. So, you know, the, the $100 a ton is not an overwhelming cost, and it's something that we're just going to have to build in. We don't throw our trash in the street today, at least not in Livermore anyway. Um, and, and we're not going to be able to throw our CO2 in the air, and we're going to have to pay to clean it up. And, and, but it's not an overwhelming cost. Yeah, I agree. And the cost savings uh, uh, from avoided impacts, uh, I think more than offset the cost that, that we need to, to incur to reduce our emissions. And I think the, the funding needs to come, you know, both from uh, the government and from the private sector. And uh, the more that we can use public sector funding to leverage private sector investments, I think the better. And another question that comes up related from, from a few folks in the audience is, uh, how does a car, you know, price on carbon fit into all of this? Uh, you know, uh, is, you know, I mean, I think, I think in part it leverage, it, that's part of the leverage you're talking about in some ways, Kathy, but, but uh, uh, you know, how does, you know, some sort of national economy wide price signal on, you know, up to, to that, you know, the, the CO2 is trash and we need to pay for it. Um, uh, how does that factor into all of this? Well, depending on how the legislation is structured, uh, if it generates revenue, it can help invest in uh, carbon reductions in uh, uncapped um, sectors uh, and help with research and development that we've all talked about needing to see more of uh, to advance these uh, carbon removal technologies uh, and natural climate solutions. So. Hopefully uh, a program, uh, if it were generating revenue, would uh, be investing in, in some of these important uh, technologies. 
Yeah, I think we're also seeing something similar with clean energy standards, um, including at the federal level that are being proposed where they're looking at how to make sure to include negative emissions technologies. But yeah, I agree with Kathy. I mean, this is something that could definitely be helpful, I think, for us. Um, this might be the Aaron Burns and not Carbon 180 perspective. I don't know. We're not banking uh, on a you know $200 per ton carbon tax soon. Um, obviously, something like a carbon tax would be incredibly helpful for uh, negative emissions technologies. Um, and in particular, you know, not just the, um, you know, getting at the actual cost of what we're doing that um, both Roger and Kathy hit on, but as Kathy mentioned, like reinvesting that, you know, where that money would be reinvested. But um, I think it's something where we think a lot about if there were to be a carbon tax, let's make sure that carbon removal uh, benefits from that, that that's structured in a way that's helpful for carbon removal. But I think we're looking at a much broader set of policies. And uh, Aaron, something you said earlier uh, comes through in a, uh, in a few different flavors on the, on the Q&A. And this is kind of basically the, the people slash land use interaction issue. And, I, and the questions are framed in lots of different ways, but, but it, it almost doesn't matter if we're talking about natural or technological here. There is some sort of friction or potential friction around you know, a big new DAC plant in somebody's backyard or CO2 underneath their backyard or uh, uh, interactions between agricultural interests and forestry, uh, things like that. And I'm just wondering, you know, you, you mentioned people need to want this, they need to see the benefit. Um, but but for, for the three of you, like, what are, is there, is there a policy role to getting, uh, to dealing with, with these kind of interactions and potential issues? Um, or, and, or, and, and if yes, what is that? And if not, or what else can be done beyond that, you know, beyond the government role to help um, facilitate some of this? Because it seems like some, some of these things are age old around say, you know, land use and agriculture and forestry, for example, but some of these are very new around CO2 injection, um, but they really do come down to kind of a basic um, a basic uh, 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 dissonance there. So anyway, I'm just curious in people's thoughts on kind of what can be done on that front. Uh, it seems like if we don't get over that hurdle, we may not get anywhere with any of this. Yeah, for, for natural, yeah. oops, sorry, go ahead. For natural climate solutions, it's really critical that any, any programs and policies that we advance uh, help landowners do what they want, you know, achieve what they want to achieve and that they're designed to work for those landowners. If we're going to achieve the potential of the land sector, we, we have to influence hundreds of millions of acres in, in the U.S. And, um, and so we're not going to do that if we're designing programs that are hard for landowners to engage with. So that's a, a critical factor um, as we think about natural climate solutions. Um, we definitely think policy has a big role to play here. I want to point out two different uh, pieces of work from two different colleagues. Our chief scientist, Jane Zelikov, is actually a soil scientist by training, and she worked with farmers and ranchers in the Mountain West to understand what their view and what they would be interested in doing on soil carbon removal and how they interacted with uh, federal policies on this and like what kinds of changes they would like to see. And so I think some of that on the ground, on the ground work is going to be really important. My colleague, Ogbad Kosar, is also leading our environmental justice work that is looking across solutions. What are questions and concerns from environmental justice organizations um, when we're thinking about scaling these up? I think, as you mentioned, John, um, this is true on the tech, you know, the technological side for carbon removal might be a little bit newer, but when we're talking about energy technologies, that isn't new, right? right. Um, and these uh, direct air capture, carbon capture are really tied to the fossil industry for a lot of these communities. Um, and so those are, uh, that's a huge challenge, right? They are very uh, understandably skeptical about what it's gonna look like to have direct air capture um, in their communities. And so I think policy has a huge role to play there. Um, I also think it has a, you know, I, and I, I would think about it kind of in, in two ways and we talked about this a little bit, but like, what is the role of policies, regulatory policies and making sure that we do this really well, that communities are protected, that communities who do choose to have these um, you know, that they are executed in a way that's beneficial for those communities that you have, um, you know, good regulations on, on saline storage, that you have, um, you know, thoughtful construction of that infrastructure. Um, 
that you have good community, uh, not just participation, but community engagement as, like along the whole pathway of decision making. That's obviously something that we, we have a huge challenge in. I also think, again, it's who benefits from this. Uh, there was an article I saw I was reading recently. Again, I'm not the ag person, but, you know, there's been a lot of stimulus funding for ag. Um, and who's getting that? funding like who's getting that policy support and this was pointing out that um this was particularly so from west virginia so a lot of west virginia specific things but that black farmers in appalachia were not benefiting from this and so there's a long history not just of these um you know scaling up energy and and ag industries that you know might do harm to some communities but also that don't that lots of communities are very specifically excluded from accessing their benefits and so I think it's really important to think about it from both perspectives and that I think policy has a huge role in both um, addressing those um, kind of how those existing inequities have been enshrined in law and then also creating new laws and creating new policies um, to scale this up in a much more equitable and just way. You know, one of the, the fun things about a forum like this is to sort of look down the road and say what's coming at us, what's in the future, what have we failed to um, recognize and I think we've touched on one of the important points here is that we've talked about money for a long time in this field we've talked about energy for a long time in this field and I don't think either of those are going to limit us anymore the energy renewables have, have basically got it covered and energy is cheap I think we have the money to handle the carbon we need what we don't have is the land everybody wants to use somebody else's land to do this job here in California I run into people say why don't we just cover the desert with solar panels there are people who like the desert just the way it is. Same with forests, same with communities. And so I think this issue of land use is gonna be overwhelming and, um, and we're gonna to have to work on it now. And the, the points that, that you know, my, my partners here on the panel have raised are exactly right. We need to think about who benefits and who bears the burdens of these new, this new carbon economy, this new future that we're facing. Great. So uh, there's a lot of questions about specific federal policies and their likelihood of revision or uh, enhancement or extension in the near future. I am going to roll all of that up to one uh, one zinger for the three of you, which is uh, given the new um, you know new president elect, new Congress uh, for the for to the amount that you folks think about federal policy. Uh, you know what's you know, br very briefly, and Aaron already touched on this a bit for DAC, but, uh, you know, what's feasible in, in the next Congress or, or, or in the executive action space uh, to help keep the ball rolling here uh, in the near term uh, and, and start to get more carbon removal happening in America? Certainly, I think uh, re-entering the Paris Accord would be a, a great first step. Um, uh, to get back into that community and be able to um, really think through what our, our an update of our nationally determined contribution should be. So that's uh, one of the near term things that I think uh, would be really important. I think we're going to continue to see updated R&D funding. I think we're going to see a new authorization for Office of Fossil Energy and other agencies. Um, I'm sorry, other offices at the Department of Energy. Um, you might see something like the Clean Industrial Technology Act move forward, where you're looking at moving away from an electricity sector uh, focus uh, at the Department of Energy to seeing more cross-agency work. I think you're also hopefully going to see a lot more cross. Uh, sorry, I keep saying cross-agency, cross-office work. So ERE working with FE, etc. I think you're going to see more cross-agency coordination. I think um, this new administration has, again, has signaled their interest in working on carbon removal. So thinking about, you know, what could it look like to have, um, uh, you know, OSTP coordinating carbon removal? Um, and I'm going to plug here. We, we have a book of recommendations. We have a, a small transition book uh, set of recommendations coming out next week um, that'll have a lot more specificity. Um, I think you could see an extension and an update to some of the tax credits. Um, uh, 45Q obviously comes up, but there have been interest in something like 45T on the natural and land side. Um, there have been things like the Growing Climate Solutions Act and you know, that's a really big bill, but there's lots of pieces of that that I think could really move forward. You can see increased funding, not just for Department of Energy, but for, you saw, um, I talked about DAC, but you saw more funding at USDA for soil carbon sequestration practices. You're seeing more interest in um, what forestry policy for private and for um, public lands and for private owners. I think also you're gonna see more funding at places like um, 
like at EPA. Um, that's something that's really bipartisan right now for the classic storage program. Um, just that, not EPA as a whole, that's still unfortunately partisan, but things like the underground injection control program where they're overseeing this, um, the permitting of geologic storage, that's gonna be really important. Um, and then I think the other thing that you could see that's really interesting in the near term is that procurement piece. Um, again, we're doing a lot, this is all my colleagues, but another white paper coming out around um, that concrete procurement role, but that's been something that folks have been talking about. You have companies who are making um, CO2 embodied uh, concrete today, a lot of it's cost competitive with incumbents. And so you could have the government coming in and saying the federal government being a purchaser of these um, products to kind of uh, help that market get started. I think there's, um, uh, you know, some potential to see something like that happen as well in the near term. And more money for Livermore, Roger? <laughs> so, um, you know, as a, as a national lab employee, I can't uh, actually opine on policy. Right. But what I what I can say is that the low carbon fuel standard in California has been remarkably effective at encouraging new technologies to come into the market. And it and so that that's a that's a thing that, I, you know, I'd like to see California expanded. I'd like to see something like that um, around the country because. It, it's it's hard to guess exactly what the right answer should be, but in this case, the right answer is less carbon in the atmosphere. And so, when you have policies that use that as their driving force, I think they're going to be very effective. And you know, that two hundred dollars a ton that we have from the LCFS today is driving a lot of new technology. Fascinating. Great. Well. Um... We're on the hour, uh, and so I think we're going to wrap it up. But I want to—I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to the audience for everybody tuning in for um, our sixth and final Carbon Solution Series on carbon removal. Uh, I, and I want to say thank you to Roger and Aaron and Kathy for uh, their expertise and their uh, thoughts today. I think it's—we've uh, covered a lot of ground in a in a short amount of time, and I, I certainly learned a lot. So thank you to the three of you. Yeah. Um, and uh, and thanks everybody for tuning in today and uh, stay tuned. There's going to be lots more lots more great events at CSIS uh, and they're all easy to attend now with the uh, everything online. So uh, thanks everybody and have a great rest of your day.